Welcome back! Now that you've designed your own animations and have a bunch to choose from, this video is about interaction. We'll be using the buttons on the micro bit to choose from many animations. For those of you following along from the last video, we have the on start block filled with a variable called number of pixels that sets up how many pixels we have. We've set up a NeoPixel strip connected at pin 2 with that number of pixels. And we created a few animations that let us play with addressing each pixel individually that we've organized into these functions. Woot! We could think of the forever loop as a timeline where we continue to add animation after animation in a long sequence. But what if we want to choose what animation plays? Let's create some code that will let us use the micro bits buttons to change the animation. Buttons are a type of input, and inputs are circuit components that let your micro bit sense and interact with the real world. The micro bit comes with a handful of other inputs, like a microphone that can run code when loud noises happen, a touch sensor that lets you run code if you touch it, the accelerometer that lets you run code if you shake it, and more. We'll be using the buttons, so let's check that out. I'll go to the input code drawer and select the first block on button pressed and place it in the workspace. You'll notice that it's square like the forever and on start blocks. I can place it anywhere I want, and instead of running in sequence within the forever loop, this block will run the code inside of it whenever the button is pressed. This is called an event handler, a part of a program that runs when something happens. I can choose button A, B, or A and B pressed together to trigger the code inside of it. Let's do all three. I'll just copy and paste on my keyboard to make two more on button pressed blocks. They'll start out as inactive because there already is a button A pressed block, but I'll just select B instead. Now we have one block for when B is pressed and one block for when A and B is pressed together. My goal now is to make it so that when we press button A, one animation plays, when we press button B, a different animation plays, and when we press both of them together, a third animation plays. So I'll drag different functions to each. Let's do one color wipe in button A, rotate one pixel in button B, and I'll drag this new animation that I created into button A and B pressed. In the last video, I challenged you to create a function that animates the rainbow. Did you make it work? I've included that function here too, which I called rainbow cycle. And I'll just throw away these other functions in the forever loop. We won't need them right away. So let's see, I have button A pressed, button B pressed, and button A and B pressed. Let's take a look at the simulator. Now when I press button A, I get a yellow wipe. When I press button B, I get a single pixel of violet. And if I press A and B, I get a rainbow. It's impossible to click on two things at once with a mouse. So the micro bit simulator adds this button here that acts the same as pressing both buttons in real life. Speaking of real life, let's see it in action on the micro bit. Download the code. Okay, pressing A. Pressing B and pressing A and B together. But what's different? We're only seeing the animation happening once, right? But before it happened over and over. That's because it's no longer in the forever loop. And the on button pressed blocks just run the code inside them once when the button is pressed. So what if we wanted to keep playing the animation? And what if we wanted to have more than three options? What we need to do is create animation modes. Then use the buttons to select the mode instead of selecting a specific animation. We need to keep track of what mode we're in. So let's make a variable and call it mode. I'll go to variables. I'll click on make a variable and I will call it mode. Then let's start the program off in mode one. So I'll grab the set mode two block and drag it to the on start block. And let's go ahead and change that to mode one. So we're starting at the beginning in mode one. Next, I want to make it so that button B on the right goes to the next mode and button A on the left goes to the previous mode. I'll go to the variable drawer again and choose change mode by and place it in the on button B pressed block. 
So now, every time button B is pressed, the value of mode will increase by one. And I'll do the same for on button A pressed. So I'll just copy and paste it. But in this block, we want the mode to change by negative one, so go down by one. So now every time button A is pressed, the mode decreases by one. And when A and B are pressed together, let's make that reset the mode back to one. So I'll place a set mode to one block here. Great. We can see this in action. I'll click the snail here in debug mode, and that will let me see the value of the variable mode. So when I press button B, you can see the value of mode going up. And when I press button A, you can see the value of mode going down. And it can even go to a negative number if I keep pressing it. Now, let's tell the program what to do when the mode is equal to each of these numbers. To do this, we'll need to think logically. Logical. Let's head to the logic drawer. Here, we'll look in the conditional section to find the if-else block. I'll drag it to the forever loop. This block runs conditionally. If whatever is here is true, then the code inside the first section runs. But if it isn't true, then the code inside the else section runs. I'll head back to the logic drawer and grab the first comparison block and place it here. Then I'll go to the variables drawer and grab my mode variable and place it in the first spot. I can change this to one. So now my code reads, if the mode is equal to 1, then run the code inside. Else, or if not, then run the code inside this next section. Okay, but this is so that we can make tons of modes, right? Well, let's make more. I can click on the plus sign at the bottom, and let's click it four times. One, two, three, four. Now my block reads, if mode is equal to 1, then do this. Else, if mode is equal to 2, and I'm just copying and pasting and changing this to 2, then it'll do this. And I can just keep copying and pasting and placing these in their spot and change this to 3, 4, and, oops, 4, and 5. Then, if mode is equal to 3, or 4, or 5, then do the stuff in their section. And if it isn't equal to any of that, do what's in this section. So we have a structure, yes. Let's fill it in. So I'll drag these functions into each spot. Now, if the mode is one, we'll see my favorite animation, rainbow cycle. And if it's two, we'll see rotate one pixel. And if it's three, we'll see one color wipe. Four will be, well, you might have more functions to put here, but for now I'll reuse rotate one pixel and I'll make it a different color. Let's make it white. And five will be one color wipe. I'm making this in the USA, so let's actually do three colors. One color wipe three times and make it red, white, and blue. So let's see what's happening using the debug tool. So now our mode is set to one to start. Now if I press B to increase the mode to 2, it skips over the first section and runs the code in the second section, and so on and so forth. But what happens when it becomes greater than 5? Nothing. Nothing happens. And the same will happen if I keep hitting A to decrease the mode to below 1. So let's change that so that if the mode gets too high, it loops back around to 1, and if it gets too low, it loops back around to 5. So this time, instead of setting the mode equal to a number, I'm going to say, if the mode is greater than 5, then go back to variables and say set the mode to 1. So if it's greater than 5, go back to 1. And if the mode is less than 5, one, then I'm going to copy and paste, set the mode back to five. So now it goes up until it loops back around and it goes down until it loops back around again. Now the code reads, if the mode is equal to one, two, three, four, or five, do the animations inside. And if the mode is greater than five, reset it back to one. And if it's less than five, go back to five. So that about covers all the possible values of mode.
And if you have a different number of modes than I do, say eight, be sure to change the number in the greater than block and the set to block here. But let's go back to five for our purposes. So there we go. I like the idea of putting my favorite animation in mode one and having a shortcut to it. So I'll leave this to say set mode to one when button A and B is pressed. So we have a fully functioning mode picker. But one more thing I should mention before you go. When your code is in the middle of a function and the mode changes, it finishes the function before checking if the mode changed. So if you have a function with pauses, you'd see your code's mode change only after it's done. There are some ways to design around this and maybe I'll make a video about that in the future. But for now, just know that it may take a few seconds to change modes and you're not doing anything wrong. And that's it. Let's download the code to the micro bit and see it in action. All right, here we go. Next mode. Next mode. Next mode. Next mode. Previous mode. Previous mode. Go ahead and fill in your modes with the animations that you've created. And if you think this is cool, in the next video, I'll show you how to add just a few simple blocks to send the mode between micro bits using radio. This is especially useful to create multi-part projects like having two micro bits inside of each of the wheels of your bicycle that sync with each other, or having a group of friends synced together, or just having a remote control for pretty much any project. That's what we'll be working on in the next video. I'll see you there.